Right, this is the appointed time, and we have a quorum. So thank you for attending. Let's first invite the administration in. Thank you for attending the meeting of the Bills Committee on Fire Services Amendment Bill 2016. I think we have the attendance list in front of us. I am going to not going to uh, read it out at the meeting of the 20th of December 2016. The Bills Committee completed class-by-class -class scrutiny of the Bill, and in relation to the views expressed by members and the legal advisor on the point of drafting at the last meeting, the issues are set out in electrical, uh, the uh, electrical paper CB bracket 2656-1617 slash Bracket 01, and the government's response to the issues uh, arising from the last meeting are set out in the, the same uh, in the paper 656 slash 1617 bracket 02. I will now invite uh, the uh, deputy secretary for security, Mr. Vic Yao, to walk us through the paper and see if members have follow up questions. Thank you, Chairman. The chairman, uh, the uh, paper is uh, our response to issues ar arising from the last meeting, and there are three major issues raised by the legal advisor and members. Most of them are on the the point of drafting, and also on uh, suggestions to amend the provisions. So perhaps I'll sp spend a bit of time to walk you through the paper for. Regulations 7, bracket 3 and 4, we propose to include the words or for, and there was a question on other provisions in CAP 95B, whether similar wording will be added to other provisions. I need to explain that, first of all, for 7, bracket 3 and 4, the expression or for or in Chinese Waxi Wai Goi Chu Yi Zhong sets out the scope of the duties of the officer concerned. So during the inspection and testing of the fire services installation, it is true that part of an SF uh, FSI may arguably be installed outside the boundaries, so we'd like to include the phrase to clear any ambiguity about the RFE scheme when we describe the duties of the RFE uh, it will be uh, clearer and it can also remove any ambiguity and that is why Comparing to the 2015 bill, we have added the expression or for in the English version to set out the scope of FSIs to be tested or inspected. And we also have the uh, regulation 6, 8, and 9 with a similar description. We have considered very carefully whether we should make a similar amendment. The regulations have to do with the um, responsibilities of uh, registered fire service installation contractors and owners of FSI, and for these provisions covering the responsibilities of RFSICs and owners of FSI, we will carefully 
review the relevant provisions. And on the point of whether amendments should be made, once well, in the context of that review, we will consider the issue in a more comprehensive manner. And if amendments are necessary, we will amend all the provisions relating to the contractors and owners of FSI. So that's our response to the first issue. The second issue is about Regulation 7, Bracket 4, about the power of the director and his representatives. For the proposed Regulation 7, Bracket 4, when any FSI is to be inspected and tested, the purpose is for checking its safety and the efficiency of its working order, and that's the wording used. At the last meeting, questions were raised as to whether the provision would not provide sufficient flexibility for the director. And we're grateful for the comment. We also consider whether more flexibility should be given to the director for carrying out his duties. We understand the committee's concern. Our intention is that when an F FSI is inspected and tested, the purpose of doing so would be to check its safety and efficiency of its working order. But notwithstanding that, we note members' concern. And also, we have this phrase for Regulation 7, Bracket 4, but not in 7, Bracket 3. In relation to RFEs and the director of fire services, um, why there should be any difference in the scope and purpose of the inspection and testing. And that is why, to address these concerns, we'd like to delete the phrase for checking its safety and the efficiency of its working order from Regulation 7, Bracket 4, in order to um, allay members' concerns and also to remove uncertainties. The third issue relates to the expression of fire service equipment in Regulation 10, Bracket 1, uh, whereas the prevailing term in a bill is fire service installation instead. And last time there was a question on whether we should align or standardize the references to the same subject, and we agree with the suggestion. So I think that we can introduce a simple committee stage amendment to amend the wording fire service equipment to fire service installation or equipment, so as to align it with the terms used in other provisions. So that's the response to issues arising from the last meeting. I'll be happy to take questions from other members. And we also have prepared another paper, which is a response to submissions from deputations. Thank you. Perhaps we can walk, uh, go through this paper first. Now, for the th second or third point of this paper, Basically, the administration has accepted the Bills Committee's suggestions for Regulation 7, Bracket 4, stipulating the power of the director. Members last time suggested that the words for checking its safety and the efficiency of its working order should be deleted to remove ambiguities. And uh, Mr. Chuck just now agreed that uh, for the other point, fire service equipment should be amended to read fire service installation or equipment. So basically, our issues have been addressed. For these two matters, CSAs would be proposed, right? Right, this would, uh, these would be simple CSAs. As for the first point, I think we can hear from the legal advisor for, uh, first. Thank you, Chairman. The administration has explained 
about the expression of all four in the proposed regulations 73 and 74. So, for example, regulations 6, 7, 6, uh, 7, 9, 8, similar expression is not provided and it is not desirable because it also covers the responsibilities of fire service installation contractors and owners of FSI and they should be treated equally. But I think that on the whole it involves the responsibilities of the owners and say if the FSI falls outside the boundary of the premises, uh, at the moment there is nothing in the provision on this point. I hope that the administration will review CAP 95B as soon as possible and also the wording as mentioned so that the two versions can be aligned. And also on uh, RFE, once the scheme is introduced, You must follow up on the uh, regulation seven bracket three and four because of the uh, implications. Because here it sets out the responsibilities of the registered fire engineers FSI. Um, I hope that in the future you can take note of this um, issue. So, chap. I thank the legal advisor and basically agree with her. As I said just now, we um, understand that there is a concern over the discrepancy. Uh, but at the same time, we are reviewing the responsibilities of the registered fire services installation contractors. And because of that, we need to consult the industry as well. Uh, we believe that a holistic approach should be taken. But on the issue of um, the two different versions, we note the members. Uh, we note the legal advisor's suggestion. All right. So the government has actively responded to all the issues we raised at the last meeting. Are there any other questions, Doctor Edward Yu? Uh, first of all, I thank the administration's effort. for understanding and addressing our concerns. For Regulation 7, Bracket 3, can I give you an example? Now here you are proposing to add the words all four. That means it can be tested or inspected even if the FSI is outside the boundaries of the premises. but. There are cases in which you need to inspect the FSI uh, but not test it. Well, there is an actual case. It is like this. For instance, a new premise has to connect a fire installation to an old uh, in installation, for instance, on the, uh, on the rough, a tank, uh, a tank on the roof. And so in the original, there was no installation installed, but then the inspection has to include the water tank. So in the uh, Regulation 7.3, well, there's no newly installed. And what would be the case? Uh, it, how would you deal with such a case? Thank you, Mr. Tang. Well, let me ha raise another specific case. Regulation 7.3 limits the RFE um, to inspect all the fire system installed for the premise. Even if this sprinkler comes from a water tank, shared water tank, but that will also be part of this fire installation system. So it it is to be it is also an installation. Even if the water tank um is not in the old premise, but however such a connection was done beforehand. So technically speaking the sprinklers and the 
original tank as well as the uh, connection of pipes to the sprinklers. They are installed for the sprinklers. So the RFE will need to inspect everything in the uh, system, including the water tank. Would there be an argument on the uh, word installation? In fact, the provision, in the provision itself, uh, the word installed, it can be any time that it is installed. There's no time limit. For instance, the water tank or the rooftop um, was installed. However, in the new premise, there is a connection from the water tank, and that is also a part of the installation or being installed. So uh, in the text itself, that should be included as part of the installation. So that is fairly clear. Any other questions on this document? If not, basically speaking, we are satisfied with the active response from the administration and the uh, discussion has been clear. So there, there are to be CSA amendments. So um, that can be um, distributed to us after the meeting. Let's uh, go to the second document. At the last meeting, we were we invited the uh, submissions from the 11 deputations and one individual who had expressed uh, opinions. We invited written submissions. We had received eight submissions. Uh, it's, uh, the uh, submissions are carried in LC paper number CB2656, 16 to 17, bracket 3. And the administration has um, given a written response to the submissions. Let me invite Mr. Vic Yao to introduce this document. Thank you. We have received these written submissions and we have given an overall response. Let me uh, go through it. First of all, most uh, submissions uh, supports the two, uh, 2016 bill and um, they have also welcomed the uh, switching from negative vetting to positive vetting. Many of these uh, uh, views are on the details of implementation. Well, we, once we have enacted the provisions, we will uh, go. We will uh, propose uh, subsidiary legislation with details of implementation, and before that, we'll also consult the trades on these uh, details. Um, for the res submissions that we have received. Well, first of all, on the qualifications for the uh, RFE, in 2015 meetings, we have briefly introduced the qualifications for registration. Basically speaking, uh, whatever background the person may have, but if it, it has in, uh, enough qualifications and experience required, they can have different channels and register as uh, RFE. As for the detailed qualifications and experience, they will uh, be uh, listed out later on. As for the uh, name of the registered uh, fire engineers, uh, the, um, there will have been preliminary discussions in 2015. The submissions we received from the last quarter uh, uh, were similar. The HKIE and the IFAE expressed support, whereas the HKIS was neutral. The Builders Department Local Building Surveyors Association indicated strong objection. And these uh, are similar to the views that we collected uh, from, the last uh, from the last quarter. As explained, we have uh, chosen the RFE 
as an title, which has, which reflects um, the professional knowledge and experience within the uh, 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 within the fire engineering. So, on the whole, we feel that the RFE the title is appropriate. As for the regulatory panic mechanism um, and the regulation over RFE, uh, there have been submissions received. Simply put, there are several points raised. We have paid a lot of attention to this um, regulation, which has to do with the fire safety. First, we have we will stipulate a regular, rigorous set of qualification experience requirements to ensure that only those who are fully qualified may enter the trade. And we also issue codes of practice and guidelines to be strictly followed by the RFE. And um, the fire safety requirements and the risk assessments made will or be endorsed by the FSD, and uh, the certification done will undergo um, random checks. And if we discover any uh, uh, not uh, contrary to the requirements, there will be a disciplinary mechanism. There will also uh, uh, various uh, panels and committees, uh, um, boards to be set up, and this will will, will undergo uh, detailed consultations with the uh, uh, trades. The HKCIA also has a concern whether the um, FSD will offer uh, existing services. Yes. Um, the whole point is to offer uh, options. You can have uh, RFE uh, doing the certification, or you can also choose the FSSD services. These um, are the responses to the submissions that we have received, and um, I'm ready to ask to answer any questions that might be raised. In the submissions that we have received. Um, some, most of them have been ha had already been raised uh, during the uh, 2015 meetings, and in the um, Fire Services Amendment Bill 2016, these have been taken into account. In fact, in this framework bill. Uh, the details are not included, but for implementation are not included, but the relevant regulations and rules, as we explained last time, most of them will be uh, will be under the positive uh, vetting that will uh, erase doubts from deputations and members. Are there any further questions, Mr. Yim Chong Yim? Uh, Chong -yim. Some associations expressed a concern about the title of the RFE, which might um, give rise to confusions in the professional qualifications. For instance, if someone who has no engineering qualification. However, he meets the requirements and is registered um, the RFE, but he is not part of the engineering association member, and he, the association, uh, cannot do anything because he is not a member of this association. That will he is self proclaimed engineering engineer the title of engineering, and that could be a breach 
of uh, the association rules and even juridical rules. So members of the association uh, expressed a concern that if you allow someone who is not an engineer to claim as an RFE, there might be a confusion about the title and also the rules, uh, codes of conduct to be uh, abided by. Thank you. I'm not a professional engineer. It is true that in our community, engineer is a profession, but there are different spheres in the professional uh, in the profession. For instance, for information and bio, uh, biological sciences, they also use the title engineering. You are an RFE. Whether that you can claim for to be also at the same time biological engineering, I cannot really uh, speak about that. However, the uh, law is clear. The RFE is a very uh, professional category. It has very um, professional requirements, which would include some knowledge, for instance, the fire system, um, and also uh, human behavior in case of a fire. So um, these are um, pro uh, fire uh, engineering, a very special field. So in the uh, juridical framework, it is perfectly clear. However, people outside the sphere, if they claim that um, I, am, I am an engineer and I can also be a fire engineer, well, that will be uh, prohibited. We respect the professional uh, views and we have also consulted the um, HKIS, uh, um, the IFE. So I think that we all understand the original uh, intent of uh, the regulation. We feel that this title or the name is entirely in keeping with uh, what is uh, practiced. And um, it is also clearly uh, stated in the regulation itself. A quick follow-up. Yes, Dr. Yu. Now, is it that only statutory members of the statutory institutes of professions are eligible because let's say if somebody doesn't breach the regulation but the conduct is against the code of practice, then we would rely on the institute to meet it out disciplinary sanction. But let's say if the person doesn't belong to any institution, there is nothing that we can uh, pursue as far as professional negligence is concerned. So, well, under the registered fire engineer scheme, there is one requirement. Well, there are requirements in terms of um, the candidates' uh, pers uh, qualifications and experience, and we also have a regulatory framework to oversee the uh, conduct and the service quality of the uh, engineer. So if somebody is registered as a registered fire engineer, then he would fall under this uh, regulatory framework. And that 
the person is not required to be a member of uh, any institute, such as the Hong Kong Institute of Engineers, because under our scheme, we already have a mechanism to um, impose qualifications and experience requirements on the individual. So the registered fire engineer would be uh, regulated under this framework. Uh, I'm also an engineer by profession. In fact, even for members of the Hong Kong Institution of Engineers, And even if somebody is registered as a registered fire engineer RFE on the basis of his membership with the Hong Kong IE, the professional qualification uh, professional qualification requirements are set out clearly. One cannot uh, claim that because he's a member, he can automatically become an RFE. I think this is clear. So we have this framework ready, and we have had ample discussions since 2015. On the one hand, we cannot rule out individuals who have the relevant experience um, as a uh, as an engineer, albeit that he is not registered with any Hong Kong IE. I believe that the intention of or the object of the bill is to allow flexibility for these individuals. But of course, there would be a stringent um, vetting process. So somebody who is a surveyor can be a, an RV. And I believe that after going through the stringent vetting procedures, one can be registered as an RFE under the scheme. And on carrying out professional duties, I don't think we have ambiguities here. If the regulations are breached, then the person will face legal consequences, and as that person would also be a professional, he would need to observe the professional code of conduct. I don't think the we need to be over worried. I believe that we have flexibility, and yet I uh, it's really difficult to imagine. Uh, that uh, somebody without any professional background can be registered as an RFE. But anyway, I believe that uh, we need to uh, iron out the details um, at the later stage for the select committee to or the, for for the vetting committee to work on. Well, I think this, uh, this is a kind of control, and uh, there are three aspects. One is criminal prosecution. The other is through the complaint mechanism of the institute. Uh, the most serious penalty could be a revocation of its membership. And the third avenue may be a civil claim. So. Let's say under this framework, if that person doesn't have any membership with any professional statutory institute of professions, I want to know, um, according to the three avenues I mentioned, what will be the consequences. Chairman, I want to make it clear that uh, we're talking about somebody who is doing the work of an RFE, who is not licensed. No, he, he he is licensed, but he is not a member of any statutory professional institutions. Well, then, Chairman, perhaps in the last legislative year we had the preliminary discussion on the professional qualifications. Um, by preliminary discussion, I mean we need to further discuss with the stakeholders to become a registered. Uh, engineer, one has to be uh, a registered 
engineer by profession with experience in fire services installation. And that's one way. The other way is that the person has a relevant um, undergraduate degree in, say, civil engineering or surveying, etc. And then a further top up course on say fire services and experience and working experience. So we're talking about academic qualifications with experience. The third avenue is the mature route. We're talking about some experienced practitioners. And they can be eligible as long as they take some courses. So we're talking about the third category. Um, there, these individuals may not be registered members of the institute, and then they uh, carry the title of engineers. And then, um, through some procedures with their work experience, approved, etc., they can be uh, registered as RVs. And um, I think what you describe is correct. A civil claim is one way to deal with it. Uh, we also have a disciplinary committee to deal with breaches of the code of conduct. And we also have some serious breaches, for example, issuing false or misleading fire services certificate. And this is this could be um, a criminal offense. So it's true that after joining the profession, the member is required to observe some professional code of conduct, or else the disciplinary board may meet out punishment, and there could be civil and criminal liabilities. So instead of having three forms of control, now there are only two. There is no control coming from the professional institutions. Um, any breach of the regulation could be a criminal offence, and he may be liable in a civil claim. But then there will not be any control um, in terms of disciplinary action by the institutes. Stung. Now I think that um, the third avenue the member mentioned is similar to the disciplinary sanction mechanism under this RV scheme proposed. So for a serious serious breach of the regulation, uh, criminal liability will be attracted. Whereas for civil liability, we're talking about the relationship between the um, engineer and the uh, uh, and the client, and we're also going to include regulation or control of non-compliance in the subsidiary legislation. There will be details on the qualifications and performance of the engineer, and this mechanism will be similar to one that the institutes have. I think this should address Dr. Yu's concerns, because if somebody is registered successfully as an RFE, but then this person doesn't have the membership of any professional institute, for example, not a member of the Hong Kong IE or the uh, Hong Kong Institute of uh, Chartered Surveyors, then these institutions cannot take any disciplinary action against a person. But at the same time, there are legal responsibilities as an RFE. So I don't think that if the person isn't a member of the professional institutes, he cannot be regulated because According to the regulation, he has a lot of um, responsibilities, and he would be liable for any breach. As explained by Mr. Yao just now, there are ways for a uh, an experienced member of the industry to be registered as an RV. So if there are no other comments, then that concludes.
the discussion on these papers. And I'd like to seek members' views on the legislative timetable. Last meeting, we completed the clause by clause scrutiny of the bill. And then at the second me meeting today, we have gone through the government's responses to issues raised by members as well as the government's response to submissions. And I think we've also agreed to move committee stage amendments. I understand that these CSAs are relatively simple and there is support from the Bills Committee. May I suggest that we circulate um, the CSAs first? And unless it's ne absolutely necessary, I don't think we need to have a third meeting. I can say that um, the Bills Committee has completed its work. We have a timetable for resumption of second reading of the bill. And I've been given a table by the Secretariat. Date of resu resuming second reading of the bill could be the 1st of March, 22nd and 29th of March. If we pick the 1st of March, then the date to write to the Ho Chairman of the House Committee for resumption of second reading is the 7th of February. And the Bills Committee should submit a report to the House Committee uh, on the 10th of February. The deadline for giving notice for the public officer to resume second reading of the bill is the 14th of February. And the uh, deadline for giving notice to, for moving amendments is the 20th of February. Whereas if the date of sec, um, resuming second reading of the bill is the 22nd of March, then basically the respective dates as mentioned would be the 21st of February, 24th of February, 7th of March and 13th of March. And similarly, if we pick the 29th of March as the date when the bill, this, um, the second reading of the bill is resumed, then it's uh, 14th of March, 17th, 20th and 20th of March. So let's hear from the administration and the members. As the two proposed CSAs are quite simple, we can um, do it as soon as possible. We'd like to resume the second reading of the bill as soon as possible as well. Of course, the first option works best. That is the 1st of March 2017. Because the CSAs are not very complex, uh, we can complete the CSAs very soon. I don't think there are objections from the uh, members. So the administration would like to have the date 1st of March. So we'll follow this timetable of 1st of March. The CSA will be circulated as soon as possible. Any other business? None. This meeting ends here, and we will work accordingly to the dates agreed upon. So it doesn't seem that we need to have another meeting. Thank you very much.